Hello and welcome to Tata Literature Live, the 11th annual Mumbai International Literature Festival and the first one to be completely digital. Co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Projects, this session is presented by Mojo. The following session is a conversation between Barkha Dutt and Farid Zakaria. They will be talking about Mr. Zakaria's new book, 10 Lessons for a Post-Pandemic World. Farid Zakaria is a well-known TV host for CNN, a foreign affairs columnist, and an author. He feels that the pandemic is an opportunity to really go ahead and make some of the big changes we all know we need. Barkhada is an award-winning TV journalist, anchor, and author. She is the owner of the YouTube channel, Mojo. We welcome all of you to this very topical session of lockdown learnings. At least here in India, it seems as if COVID is not quite behind us, especially in Delhi, the national capital. The COVID surge seems to be ominously close. Yet one of the most important books to emerge at this point is talking about a post-pandemic world, not because COVID is over, but because the author believes that we should be preparing ourselves for life after COVID and for life readapted and readjusted to COVID. My very special guest today, Farid Zakaria, is the author of 10 Lessons for a Post-Pandemic World. Farid is, of course, one of the preeminent thought leaders across the world. And it is my great pleasure to welcome him to this conversation made possible by the Tata Literature Live Mumbai Lit Fest, which, like everything this year, is virtual in partnership with our digital platform, The Mojo Story. So welcome to our audience and uh, welcome, Farid, uh, to this conversation. Uh, like I said, uh, Lit Fests are now virtual, like almost everything else uh, in our life. And, uh, you know, we wish it were not the case. But one of the things you do talk about in your book uh, is adjusting for, uh, for this new reality. Now, fascinating absolutely fascinating read, but I think what really uh, sort of leaped out for me was the first chapter that speaks about buckling up, that speaks about the worst not being over, but the worst yet to come, almost as if this is still a rehearsal. Why do you think that? Well, I think if we think about, first of all, Barka, so nice to see you, alas, virtually, uh, you. and a great, great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I think the part uh, that uh, of this book that I was most passionate about is exactly that first chapter, uh, because it made me realize that we have been living our lives in a way with that, with that we, we have not been thinking about the risks we are incurring as we live it, as we develop our cities, as we eat our food, as we build our buildings. And what I came to realize it, it was that all of this has lots of risks built into it. So take this COVID example. Why did COVID strike? Well, at some level, of course, these things happen all the time. But what has been happening over the last 20, 30, 40 years is that human beings have been crowding into the natural habitats of wild animals. Uh, as development continues in an unplanned fashion, what's been happening is the natural habitat of the bat is shrinking. Bats, by the way, can have lots of viruses in them for complicated reasons. And as the bat is forced out of its natural habitat, it comes, lives closer and closer to human beings. So it tends to live at the edge of human civilization. So the viruses, which are, as I say, prevalent in bats, jump from a bat to a pig, from a bat to a chicken, from a bat, in this case, it turns out uh, probably to a pangolin, and then from that to a human being. Um, or look at the way in which we eat. 99% of meat around the world is now factory farmed. Factory farming is another invitation for the next pandemic. In fact, I'm almost certain the next pandemic will come out of something from that world of farming. You take thousands and thousands of animals, herd them together in unsanitary conditions. The viruses then hop from animal to animal, gaining strength with each hop, finally from an animal to a human. Or take the way in which we are spewing carbon dioxide into the air, which is making the earth hotter, it's making it drier, it's making, you know, there are more forest fires now. In, in uh, America this year, we, we saw 5 million acres of land burn. That is the equivalent of the entire state of Massachusetts. So what I was trying to get across was we're living in this way. It's almost the metaphor I use is it's like we're driving a fast race car through mm -hmm. unmarked terrain. And we don't bother to, you know, get seatbelts or airbags or buy insurance 
or chart the terrain out or put some shock absorbers in. No, the engine blows up every once in a while. We patch it up and we think we're back in, in business. No, we need to stop. We need to ask ourselves, how can we do this in a more thoughtful way? How can we do farming in a more sustainable way? How can we do development in a more sustainable way? And the image I say is, what we need to do is to buy insurance, get seat, bag, uh, seat belts, and buckle and, up. You know, for everyone who, who saw Contagion, the movie, and then made the mistake of seeing it uh, right in the middle of the pandemic, one thing is obvious, that people did anticipate that this was coming, right? I remember watching the movie, I don't know if you've seen it, and saying, oh my God, this, is, this was obviously anticipated by a group of scientists, even by those who make movies. One of the things that you say in your book is, we should have been prepared for this. We should not have been taken aback in the manner that we were. What were the signs? Well, the, the, there were actually so many signs it's difficult to, to uh, know but, which but one. But pick up like to. a couple of the sort of the ones that leap out at you. The, so the most important ones is that we had pandemics or, or you know, uh, epidemics that were almost pandemics. SARS, MERS, Ebola, H1N1. And in each of those, the scientists would tell us look, for particular reasons, this one hasn't turned into a pandemic. So, you know, the thing about a virus is there is a kind of sweet spot. If a virus is too lethal, then it kills the host and it can't spread. So that was the, the problem with Ebola. Ebola was obviously a terrible, dreadful disease, but because it was so efficient at killing the host, the person, it couldn't spread. Um, even SARS was a little too lethal it was killing people too fast. So you need a kind of sweet spot of a, of a virus that spreads but, and kills people. That's why you worry about it, but, not, but doesn't kill so many that it can continue to spread. Now, it turned out that this one, uh, it, it turned out that this one, uh, this pandemic, or no, it turned out this virus, uh, the novel coronavirus, was almost perfect in that. It hit that sweet spot. But each one of those before had triggered a whole bunch of debate about it. Bill Gates gave two very famous speeches mm -hmm. about it. Look, I point out in the book, even I, in 2017, devoted a whole segment of my show. And I outlined exactly what I thought was going to happen. And I got one thing wrong. I said that it would come out of Africa. It came out of China. Everything else played out exactly as I predicted. Yeah, I think I think the line you have in your book is that the coronavirus may be novel, but the but pandemics are not, and therefore exactly. the world the world should have been better prepared for it. Okay, where are we now? And you know, and I ask you this because one of the debates in India uh, is quite different from the debate in the United States of America, and that is not just the efficacy of lockdowns, but also the morality of them, right? And I ask you this because in India, it's widely believed that given our levels of inequity, given the fact that, you know, 92 million households live uh, in one room, in one room tenements, stay at home acquires a completely different meaning. It's often actually more dangerous for poor people to stay at home crowded into small spaces. Uh, the economy is really taking a hit. There are any number of people I have met while reporting the story who believe that poverty will kill them before the virus. So there is a sense that lockdowns essentially keep the middle class, the upper middle class and the rich safe, uh, but actually ruin the poor. It's a very different kind of debate that's going on in the US. So, so speak a little bit. I know your book does explore lockdowns. It looks at the failures of of lockdowns. It talks about what you call the quality of government as opposed to the quantity of government. So speak to lockdowns. Yeah, I think that what you outlined, Barka, is, is a very legitimate concern. My own view is that um, lockdowns in, in, in countries like India are probably counterproductive. Now, what, I mean, what do I mean by countries like India? Countries that are very poor, where in the cities, as you say, the poor are very densely packed together. I mean, in a place like Dharavi, the population density is 30 times that of New York City. So as you say, when you tell people to stay at home, you're telling them to stay in even more crowded conditions than they would be at work. Um, now, it's, it's still a problem because, you know, even if they go to work, they then go back home. So you haven't solved the problem by getting them to work. But the most important reason is that it seems to be that the virus is less lethal in places like India. Um, we don't have good data on this, and scientists are very reluctant to come to any grand conclusions. But the best example, to my mind, is not India, but Pakistan, where they've really done nothing. I mean, Imran Khan has basically said, I'm not going to shut down anything. And yet, 
they do not have very high levels of uh, mortality uh, relating to COVID. But there has been speculation that it might be the heat. It may be that the population has developed natural immunities to a bunch of these kinds of viruses because they, you know, they have had no alternative and because they don't get uh, as many antibiotics and things like that. But in that circumstance, I'd say make two points. One, right now, the right strategy would be a more public health focused strategy that is of testing and treatment rather than of lockdowns. Secondly, I think this is a perfect example of what we were just talking about. India should view this as a warning. India should view this as a dress rehearsal because the next virus might not be one which for some reason in places like India is not producing these high mortality rates. What if it did, right? So there needs to be a public health infrastructure that can handle this. Lockdown, the, the person who, the, the country that has handled the, the, uh, the pandemic best, Taiwan, said to me, the vice president of Taiwan, who is a uh, uh, Johns Hopkins trained epidemiologist, he said, uh, lockdowns are a sign that you have failed. Yeah. The, the best way to handle this is early action, aggressive action, and intelligent action, meaning testing, tracing, and isolation of the small number of people initially who are infected. And you, as you as people get infected, you get them out of circulation. Now, you know, can India do that? Look, Taiwan, you know, I often point out to people, Taiwan and South Korea are now regarded as these models of efficiency. 35 years ago, these were backward, you know, uh, uh, basket case dictatorships. So if India gets its act together, absolutely, it, it can do it. But, and it needs a better public health response, whether or not you have the lockdown. Yeah, I think uh, actually in India, not many people pay attention to the fact that 3,000 people die of tuberculosis every day, three, another exactly. 3,000 die of cancer, and no one's actually pulled out that comparative data. But I think we do know that the fatality, the prevalence of the COVID-19 is very high, but the, the, the fatality rate is mysteriously lower compared uh, to other parts of the world. Uh, I, 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 want to I, I, would, I would point out, just to yeah. reinforce your point, uh, Barkha, that the number of children who have died as a result of lockdowns because of malnutrition is sadly probably higher than the number who have died from COVID. No, absolutely. And, and I, I, I found myself starting as a votary of the lockdown uh, because I didn't know better and then traveling through India and becoming a complete opponent uh, of it. But it's playing, down, playing out quite differently uh, in the U.S. where it seems to be almost Trumpian uh, to want to open up. And, and, and President Trump, uh, you know, uh, is, is seen to have been exacerbating the problem with his with rallies through the campaign, with the general politicization uh, of the conversation around COVID, with wanting a vaccine to coincide with election day and so on. You have spoken about how this pandemic is going to have a cataclysmic impact, not just on the economy, but also on politics and how politics is shaped going forward. What do you think might be the biggest outcome on global politics as we know it? I think the biggest negative effect that uh, COVID-19 is having is it is dramatically widening inequality everywhere and in every sense. So take the most macro level. The greatest good news story in the world, in my opinion, over the last 30 years has been the reduction of global poverty as hundreds of millions of people in China and in India and a little bit in Africa have moved out of extreme poverty. And as you know, extreme poverty, we're talking about $1.75 a day, under $2. I mean, this is very, very extreme poverty. People moving out of that means, you know, they finally get two meals a day. They finally, their children don't die of malnutrition. 500 million people have moved out of poverty uh, in the last 30 years. 100 million will, will fall back into extreme poverty this year. And the number will probably be somewhat similar next year. So we have seen a massive increase in global inequality. If you look at it at an individual level, Barka, as you were saying, I mean, middle class, upper middle class, people like us, our lives have been inconvenienced. This is kind of weird to do, uh, to do our conversation on Zoom like this, but we can still function. We can still manage to, to, uh, you know, to live our lives and most importantly, continue our careers. But for a whole group of people, Anyone working in restaurants, in hotels, on cruise ships, in retail, you know, life is, it's, this is like the Great Depression. And those people tend to be low wage anyway. So you're seeing a massive widening of inequality between, let's call it the kind of digital class at the top and the non-digital class at the bottom. 
And then even within companies, you are seeing massive inequality. So I'll give you an example even of my book. So my book, which mercifully is doing well, is partly been uh, buoyed by the success of books everywhere. So it turns out book publishing is one of the industries that has benefited from COVID. Not everyone is watching TV. There are a few souls who are actually reading. But at the start of the uh, pandemic, Amazon represented about 30% of the book market in the United States. The estimates are it's about 60%, maybe even 70% now. So it's who's lost out? It's all the little dukandars. It's all the independent booksellers. It's all those people. So everywhere you are seeing this widening of inequality. Now, I think it's difficult to be sure what the politics of this, but remember the global financial crisis and how it was only after several years that we realized that the effect of the global financial crisis was to create uh, you know, wins for right-wing populists and nationalists everywhere in the world. So I suspect there's something like that that's going to come out of this great widening inequality. I, I was just going to ask you that, that there's a sense that the pandemic provides the perfect context uh, for, for sort of uh, dictatorial governments, right, uh, which can act by arguing that it is for the benefit of the greatest number of people. And do you, do you see signs of that? Because the election in, in America has taken a different turn. How might you think Biden would look at the pandemic differently from Trump? So I think you're absolutely right, but I would put it beyond dictatorships. I think governments everywhere um, have seen this as an opportunity to expand their powers. And one of the most worrying signs, Barca, has been that a lot of, a lot of democracies, uh, you have seen uh, elected leaders who are quite po popular, who have used this occasion to expand their authority, to increase their powers, to do things that they, they you know, shouldn't be doing with regard to the press or NGOs and things. And frankly, that's true in India as well. So this is a concern, I think, all, everywhere. Um, in, in, the, in the US, I think that the debate is somewhat particular and unique. And I should point out, Dira, remember, in the US, our fatality rates are quite high. Yeah. So it's not like India. I mean, we, we, were, we are at 250,000 dead. By probably February or March, the United States will have lost more people to COVID-19 than they lost in World War II. So, you know, this is, this is, a, real, this is a real national crisis. Um, I hope that what Biden will do is to try to put in place the kind of system that I was describing in Taiwan. The, the only way you can open up is if you can isolate those people who are infected and potentially infected. So that means testing, tracing, isolation. If you can do a national system like that, you will make it work. It's tough in America because one of the geniuses of America is it is a very decentralized bottom-up country where actually the president doesn't have that much authority. It, you know, there are, there are, in fact, thousands of different local units of government that have the responsibility for healthcare. But that only makes the job of leadership more difficult and it requires a kind of certain both heroic quality and also incredibly competent managerial authority. But you can do it. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt did it. Lyndon Johnson did it. Reagan did it in his own way. So what I hope Biden will do is you have to provide incentives and, and you know, things like that. But you create a system where as long as people are getting tested rapidly, regularly, then you can, you, can, you know, I mean, look at uh, my son goes to a school, uh, college, which luckily has the resources, Yale. Uh, they test their students every twice a week. They have a, reduced the population size slightly. They've, uh, they've um, uh, disallowed large classes. Mostly everything is on Zoom. They have had a tiny number of infections. So they are able to manage, right? So that's a metaphor for you can do this. There's a way to stay open and also to keep the, the death rates down. But it requires a, a real public health, aggressive public health response. Right. You, your book talks about bioterrorism. And, you know, if you couple the science on this with the conspiracy theories that everybody has with the sort of ferocious resentment that much of the world today feels against China, uh, how, do you, how do you see this conversation playing out? And, you know, when Trump kept calling it the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus, did, did you think that there was there must have been many takers for it, because even here in India, if you couple the, the COVID with the Chinese incursions that took place uh, in, the, in the Himalayas, there's a lot of anger suddenly in many parts of the world with China, leading to the big question, you know, how is Biden going to be different with 
with China than Trump was. So I think in general, it's always important to remember there are always takers for the idea that your problems are, can be blamed on some foreigner, some foreign nation, some group of foreigners. Um, it's a much more seductive thing to hear than to hear that I, A, either it's accidental or B, it's caused by a mixture of incompetence or, you know, uh, uh, reasons beyond your control. Um, no one wants to hear that. They want, I mean, the, the reason conspiracy theories work is we as human beings all crave patterns. We want to believe the world is ordered. Uh, and, you know, conspiracy theories lend a great deal of order to an otherwise chaotic world. Clearly, the Chinese mishandled the virus in the beginning. But to be fair, Almost every time a virus of this kind starts, the country where it originates mishandles it somewhat because they don't know it's, you know, the, the, the first player in this is always dealing with ignorance and stupidity and things like that. Now, it's fair to say that the Chinese, because of their repressive political system, also uh, suffered because there was a great reluctance to, to tell the truth, to be honest, you know, within a dictatorship, that, that is something that is that does not come easily to lower level bureaucrats. And so the system got gummed up for some, uh, but you know, after, I'd say after about a month, it's not fair to say that the Chinese had any, uh, you know, there was any uh, you know, kind of specifically Chinese uh, malign intent. It was mostly then the incompetence of other public health authorities, in, including in the US. But you're right, there is this growing suspicion of China. And look, there are two two reasons for it, I think. one. The Chinese under Xi Jinping are behaving differently. Look at the, the Himalaya incursion. You know, Deng Xiaoping, when he modernized China, his famous mantra for foreign policy was hide your light under a bushel, meaning don't make waves, just modernize, grow rich, take, you know, take advantage of the international system, but don't try to be dominant. Very different from Mao, uh, who was trying to fund revolutionaries all over the world. Xi Jinping in some ways rep rep represents a return to a, not to a Maoism, but to a Chinese great power strategy that says we, we need to be seen and recognized as the great power of Asia. Um, and so it's not just with India, it's with the Vietnamese, uh, it's with the Philippines, it's with Japan. There have been uh, fl the flexing of, um, uh, of muscles. There have been intelligence incursions into Australia. So what, there, there is a part of this that is absolutely rooted in the reality that China has become more aggressive. And by the way, has also become more statist at home. The state is in greater uh, control of the economy. The second piece of this, I, I think it's fair to say, is that uh, the United States, that's a part of the United States and probably part of Europe also, has become very resentful of China's rise. Um, you know, particularly working class people who feel correctly or incorrectly that their jobs were taken by Chinese companies, by Chinese, you know, uh, firms that they uh, they had the outsourcing has led to them losing their jobs. The reality is much more complicated. A lot of those jobs were lost to technology. A lot of those jobs uh, are not really ones advanced industrial countries can do anymore. But you take those two things together. And there is a deep resentment of, about China. Biden will, I think, have a more rational policy, will have a more sensible policy, less emotional. Um, but I think he'll, he's going to be tough on China. I mean, I think that we are entering, as you know, I write in the book, we are entering a new age of bipolarity where the United States and China are in a league uh, ahead of everybody else. And the relationship between them will determine the geopolitical structure of the world. Well, at, that, at, at this point, I have to ask you what many Indians would want your take on, you know, what does this presidency mean for India? And, you know, even in during the campaign, there were people on the right of center who did not even want to feel a kind of uh, cursory pride in, uh, in the fact that Kamala Harris is biracial and that her mother came from Tamil Nadu because there was that sense that this administration, from a right-wing perspective, uh, will be more intrusive than the Trump administration was. Do you believe that that is indeed how it's going to play out, that whether it's on the Kashmir issue or the place of Muslims in India, uh, because we do know that Biden did take a place in the citizenship legislation in his campaign or on other issues of human rights, uh, we will see something happen that is different from what happened with Trump? 
I think actually Biden's administration will be a very good thing for India. Let me explain why. First of all, um, he will. First of all, Joe Biden is basically a free trader. He does not believe in protectionism, putting up walls, putting up tariffs, which is the single biggest threat to, to the Indian economy, not just from the U.S., but if the U.S. were to do that, it will create a world of tariffs and barriers and borders. And if India is going to grow, it needs to be able to trade with the rest of the world. Secondly, Biden is going to be much more uh, welcoming with regard to immigration, which is something central to, I think, India's understanding of its place in the world with millions and millions of people around the world uh, working and, of, you know, remittances uh, that come back to India far dwarf any kind of foreign aid that India ever, get, uh, ever gets. Thirdly, Biden will have a more sensible policy on China, which I think helps India because India is going to have to balance a, a dance, which is India wants to interact with China economically, but it wants political, geopolitical assurances. Uh, and that I think that balance is going to be better achieved uh, under Biden than under Trump, who is, by the way, also just such a weird, mercurial figure. There was no real Trump foreign policy toward India. Trump liked Modi. They did a few uh, political events together. But if you were to ask what was the sustained day-to-day -day strategy, that in, what did India get in terms of benefits from Trump? Uh, nothing, because because Trump doesn't really have much of a strategy. I mean, he, you know, honestly, after the, the the photo op is done, he forgets about it. And there's nobody in the administration carrying on foreign policy. This is, if you read John Bolton's book, this was Bolton's biggest yeah. re realization that nobody did anything in the White House other than to respond to Trump's latest barrage of tweets and figure out how to manage around them. The most important part, I think, that people talk about in India is this issue of will Biden be more intrusive? Look, the way I think about this is India is a mature liberal democracy. It should invite inspection, uh, comment, uh, people having views on India. Um, the United States gets this all the time. People, people are always telling the United States it can handle its racial issues better. It can handle policing issues better. And by the way, it's all true. Why, why should India take this, this attitude of being so allergic to you know, people from outside looking, looking in? You know, an open democracy gains strength from open discussion, criticism, comment. There are a lot of things in India that are fantastic. There are some things in India that should be improved. If a foreigner, and whether it's a person from the press, from an NGO or government says it, we, you know, Indians should welcome that. They're mature enough. The democracy is strong enough that can withstand it. I worry a lot about India going down a path that looks a lot more like Erdogan's Turkey or even Putin's Russia, where you're banning, you know, foreign NGOs. You're, you're being suspicious of foreign media and you're bristling at every time a foreign government says something, uh, something negative about India. I, I think, you know, Indians should take it in their stride. And most importantly, ask the question is, is it true? Uh, that's the more important issue than who says it. And if it's true, let fix it. That's at least the attitude I take when somebody criticizes America. Often the criticism is valid. So what what worries you as someone whose who's family uh, is partly still here, who's from, who has roots in Bombay? What, what worries you about India today? I think... Um, the, I, I want to be careful because I think it's such a complicated uh, issue. Sure. But I think it's fair to say that um, one of the greatest legacies of Indian independence was not just independence from the British, but it was the, the effort to create a truly pluralistic model for the country, which I thought was so, and I remember growing up with this feeling, um, it was just a kind of a magical sense of both pride and and day-to-day -day, uh, reality that one lived with, uh, which was that, you know, we celebrated all the holidays uh, in my family. We celebrated Diwali and Holi like it was our own. We would, uh, for our Eid celebrations, we used to have, I would say, 50 to 60 percent of the people who would come and visit uh, would, be, would be Hindus or Christians. Uh, we celebrated Christmas. And that was one of the big differences I noticed even when I came to America, which is in America, people tolerate other religions. In India, we actually intermingle. 
And there is a sense of synergy that comes out of that. And if you think about, you know, something like Indian music, uh, the ghazal, uh, or, or even a kawali, it is, they use the structure, the musical structure of the rags, and you use Persian poetry overlaid onto it. And those two combined produce the kind of synchronistic culture in India that is celebrating the mingling of the religions, not the, not, you know, not the separation, not simply the tolerance of it. And I worry that we are losing that and we're losing it. And I don't want to blame any one person. There's look, there is a cultural turn in India towards a certain kind of uh, Hindu, uh, Hindutva and Hindu nationalism. Politicians are often following trends rather than leading to them. And, and it's very unfortunate. I, I think that what it misses one of the truly unique aspects of India in the world. Um, India is in some ways this great universal nation. You know, it contains within it so many of the world's religions. If you think about the, you know, the cultural and linguistic differences between in India, between North and South, it, it, almost no country has that. And the ability to live in harmony and, and you know, and to mingle, uh, it's, it's a, you know, you, you don't realize it when you're in India, but it's such a marvel when you think of it from outside. And to lose that would be a huge shame. Yeah. I, I... Let me give you a counter view that might come from people on the right when you, 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 to your earlier point that as a secure, confident democracy, why should we not be scrutinized by the world? Uh, people would point back to Obama when he was president, how, how he came here, uh, great, seemed to hit it off with Prime Minister Modi. And then before leaving India, uh, spoke about this tradition of pluralism and how the Indian constitution guarantees it and it must be preserved all true. But then took the flight from here to Saudi Arabia, where there is, of course, no such pluralistic tradition, and did not necessarily make the same sort of blunt commentary there. So the view from a lot of people on the right or the neo-right might be to your argument that there is hypocrisy in the way that the West comments on India in a way that it would not comment on some of the allies or even countries like China at a, at a point earlier in time. Uh, and, and that hypocrisy is able to be channeled into this kind of nationalism, uh, primordial sort of framework within which now every argument in India is taking place. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. There is, there is a double standard. I would put it this way. Democracies are always held to a higher standard. So even if you look in the Middle East, you know, the State Department will point out that in Israel, they have arrested some Palestinian youths or Arab Israeli youths or whoever it is, and you know deprive them of certain due process of law. Now they do that every day in Syria. They do that every hour in, in you know in, in parts of uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, th that is the reality of being a democracy and being part of that world of what is considered more advanced or civilized uh, countries. That you're you're held to a higher standard, because the truth is. The United States cannot go in and change the government of Saudi Arabia. Um, I hope that it realizes that after having tried with a few countries in the Middle East, regime change doesn't work very well. Yeah. Um, these things have to be indigenous, homegrown efforts. And so, you know, you are if you are in a in a country that has a dictatorship, you are limited because you know you you don't want to go around calling for the revolutionary overthrow of governments all over the world. So you deal with the governments you have. But I think there's always been a feeling that there is a fellowship among democracies, that you are held to a higher standard, you are, you know, you are judged by the same standards that Western countries uh, are going to be judged by. And that is one of the strengths of democracy, but it is true that means that, you know, you will, you will have greater scrutiny. I think that the mistake there, again, is to think of this in kind of purely nationalistic terms. Look, I mean, the, the defense of American foreign policy I can make is the United States is somewhat hypocritical in its application of, of morality and ethics around the world. But it's better that than, than, you know, countries like the Soviet Union and, you know, the, the British Empire before. I mean, you know, in other words, compared to what? All great powers are somewhat hypocritical and make alliances for realpolitik reasons. The U.S. is unique in at least spending some part of its time, effort, energy in trying to address concerns of broader human, hum, human rights and such. But for India, the question is, what makes India better? You know, to me, yeah. it doesn't matter where it comes from. The yeah. issue is what is going to make India a better country. 
<clears throat> sure. Uh, I have to get a questions in, in, in a couple of moments, but before that, uh, is there even a 5% chance that Trump will refuse to leave office? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> the, the beauty of the American Constitution is that it doesn't really require that Donald Trump concede. It doesn't require that he congratulate the next, uh, the next president. It doesn't require uh, that he you know, accept the results. Uh, there is a constitutional process and an administrative process. Um, so I think, you know, he would have to order the military to, to protect him in the White House and to stop Joe Biden from entering, uh, which they will not do. It, and they, by the way, signal that very clearly. Yeah. But the fact that you're asking this question, Barca, tells you just how unusual and how dangerous Donald Trump has been to democracy. Trump, in many ways, is just an oddball, an entertainer, you know, reality TV guy. Some of his policies, by the way, have been fine. I've even agreed with them. But the, what he represents more than anything else is this great danger to democracy that comes from a narcissistic demagogue for whom his own survival and his own well-being are all that matter. In, in, in the process, if he has to shred norms, if he has to even bend laws, He's happy to do it. I think that part of Trump is the part that I am most strongly opposed to because, you know, th these norms take s decades, maybe centuries to build, and then you can shred them in a, in a few years. The, the rules can be bent, but then it's very hard to you know, bring them back into line. Uh, and I think it just reminds us, and I hope it reminds Indians, democracy is very fragile. Um, yeah. You know, you start... Uh, you start cracking down on freedom of the press and these NGOs and, you know, you start doing little things and it snowballs and then it becomes very easy for the next government to take advantage of that and push it further. So one of the things that I think we need to do in the United States is to ask ourselves now, what are the post Trump, Trump democratic reforms we need to make so that we can ensure that the next president uh, does not have the ability to, you know, not release his tax returns or keep his uh, businesses operating while he is president. And these, these were norms. Maybe we've got to make them rules and laws. Yeah, because it, it's not just about who votes for whom, but about the institutional freedom that, that has to survive individual leaders. Okay, there's a bunch of questions uh, for you. When, you know, uh, you spoke about nature's revenge, I know, in your book uh, and the pandemic and, you know, the way we have lived and, and nature hitting back. There's a question that's, that's related to that. Kimberly says in Mumbai, the drastic change in pollution levels was so evident during the lockdown. We all woke up to see how clean the sky suddenly was once the world came to a stop. Yet it didn't take anything for us to go back to just the same habits the moment the lockdown was lifted. In that case, what hope do we really have? Well, it's a great question. But the thing to understand is these, these changes are hard uh, and they need to be, you know, they, they, it's not a switch you can turn on and off. It's absolutely true that the lockdown allowed everybody, by the way, everywhere in the world, uh, friends of mine in Los Angeles were saying the same thing, uh, to see what clean air really is like and to appreciate it. Now, the problem is that also means you have zero industrial activity and zero cars and, you know, you can't have a modern economy like that. So the challenge is, to find ways, you're not, you can't, you know, do it today or in, in, in one day or even in one year to really make a push for green energy, clean alternatives over the next 10 years, put in place the kind of tax incentives, the mechanisms that will allow for it. Uh, in, India is still, of course, reliant on the most dirty of all the fuels, which is coal, uh, unfortunately, also the cheapest. But we are getting to a point where solar and some of the other technologies are about the same cost. And with a little bit of help from the government and a few incentives for the private sector, you could get there. But there is an existing huge industry that is fighting very hard. And in India, there are very powerful players who are, who are deeply wedded to the old way. So you need more of a, a, a grassroots movement. You need, you need petitions. This is something that cannot be done voluntarily. This is not a, uh, you know, a kind of a, a, a citizen's movement that can be done. You have to have laws. So any political movement has to be directed at the government, incentivizing green energy, disincentivizing the... And by the way, we face the same challenge 
in the United States. Uh, you know, it's a different uh, order of magnitude. Our air is cleaner, but it's the same basic problem. And the only solution is government has to make it possible for, you, you know, the widespread adoption of this stuff. Because if we don't, you know, this is one of those crises that you're buying insurance, but partly because you want to live a better life, but partly because this could get so out of hand that yeah. the, a crisis related to climate change could be unsolvable. Yeah. But, you know, the next question is related to finding that balance between economic sustainability and and. And, and, and taking away the lessons from this pandemic. And Shreya says, most people during this lockdown learn to live simpler lives, but simpler lives also means the economy might tank. It's a very good, it's a very good point. Um, you know, India has a very large consumption economy, just like the US. I've always thought they're very similar in that with big, complicated, uh, chaotic, decentralized, uh, and individualistic countries, where people spend a lot of money personally, and that drives the economy. Um, so I find this myself. I mean, I think you know, all of us must have noticed I mean, we, weren't, we weren't traveling as much. We weren't eating out as much. We weren't, but, you know, I didn't buy much because what was the point? You were just sitting at home with your family. Um, I think that the answer is at a, at a personal level, what I liked about it was it made you ask yourself, what are the really the most important things in life? Um, what, what matters to you? Um, I think that if one takes from it that lesson, the economy will find its way around that. There will be new products and new services that are geared more towards uh, living a more uh, simple, sustainable and enriching life. You know, whether it is meditation classes and yoga lessons or, uh, you know, organic food, which costs more. You know, the economy will find a way to adjust to human needs and wants. So I think we, sh we should be perfectly comfortable trying to embrace a more sustainable, a more organic, a more holistic life. Economic activity will continue. You don't, everybody doesn't need to, to buy new plastic toys every day for their children or, you know, they, there's, they, there will, you know, and there may be an adjustment process, but I firmly believe the long-term sustainable path uh, is very much uh, something that we saw we, we, you know, we, our eyes were awoken, uh, awakened to during the pandemic. Because remember, uh, Barga, we have 2 billion people who are going to move into yeah. the middle class over the next 20 or 30 years in the world. If all 2 billion were to eat, drink, live, wear, and, and uh, buy, you know, plastics the same way we are, I mean, you know, the, the oceans would yeah. be filled with plastic. I mean, you don't, you can imagine just, it's a very unsustainable way to live. Okay, I have time for a couple of more questions. One is a really interesting question from Manas on social media and polarization. And the way social media is organized is that the right sees the information already in line with their views and the left does the same. How do we then know what are facts? How do we then know what is true? And I know that you've spoken about how pamphleteers existed before Twitter and Facebook and WhatsApp did, and these moments have taken place in history before. But the way technology is able to organize bias is able to get people to seek, you know, confirmation bias and find, uh, you know, people being called liars if they don't reconfirm the viewer or the reader's existing bias. This is new for our times. This is new for us in the media. Yeah, you know, I have to confess, I don't have a good answer for this because I, I, I think of what I have hoped is that we are going through a phase where all this is new and we're sorting it out just as in the 18th century, the pamphleteers with these political pamphlets came out and lots of them were highly, you know, gossipy and lots of uh, untruths. And it took a while before we sorted things out. Uh, and we, you know, we relied on gatekeepers and newspapers and things like that. But perhaps that will not happen in this case. I mean, I'd, I am at a loss as to, as to know exactly how to handle this, because as you say, what social media is able to do is, is to marry technology to bias in a highly accelerated and pernicious way, where you 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 know you take people's biases and you multiply them and you exaggerate them through the constant repetition and exaggeration, but it's even beyond that, which is that we have lost the ability to agree on what truth is. Yeah. And now I tend to think that that has something to do with the deep polarization within society anyway, and that social media begins by reflecting that but then strengthens it. 
So one thing I wonder is, is there some way to get at the root problem that, you know, there are these two sides increasingly around the world, by the way, that just see the world completely differently. And, you know, we have a kind of epistemological crisis. We, we don't agree on what the facts are. We don't agree on what truth is. So if you can't agree on what truth is, how do you, you know, where do you go from there? Yeah. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. All I can say is that for people like you and me, who are in this business because we're trying to get at the truth. We're trying to get at facts. Um, we have to keep doing this because I do believe that the only, the only way to fight unreason is with reason. The only way to fight falsehood is with truth. Um, and, you know, if we give up, then, you know, the, the, I, to my mind, the battle is lost because, yeah. or, you know, and I think somewhere people understand that, they are getting from some people what is pure opinion, uh, pure pole polemics and propaganda. And there are people trying to figure out what is actually happening. My hope is that that role expands, those, that, you know, that space expands. Um, but I, it's a hope, not a prediction. Well, we live in hope. A quick last question from Anisha. If there had not been the pandemic, would Joe Biden still have won? <laughs> um, it's a very good question. Uh, incumbent presidents rarely lose uh, their their reelection bids. Uh, the economy was doing well. Um, the one countervailing point I would make is Trump was very unpopular. I think people around the world don't recognize that. So Donald Trump's approval ratings, ever since he began to run for office in 2015, have always been over 50%. So in other words, over half of America has always disapproved of him. His disapproval rating through his presidency is the lowest of ever, any president since we've been collecting data, and we've been collecting data since the 1940s. Um, he did get elected, uh, but remember, he lost the popular vote by 3 million votes. Uh, he got elected because of 70,000 votes in three Midwestern states. Um, he's going to lose the popular vote probably by 6 million votes this time. Uh, you know, the, the gap, for example, that, that Joe Biden, even in percentage terms, has is higher than any uh, incumbent has lost by since Herbert Hoover lost to Franklin Roosevelt in 1932. So I don't I don't think one can be sure that that Trump would have won re-election. Um, he was an unpopular, polarizing president. But there is a Republican advantage uh, in the Electoral College. And so I think if I were to to place money, I would say that probably Trump would have eked out a re-election, uh, probably one of the narrowest re-elections, but the pandemic certainly uh, made that much more difficult. So I think that Biden has the pandemic. You know, on the other hand, he is inheriting an yeah. economy in ruins and a pandemic. So it's it's not like he's, you know, he hasn't been uh, given a, a ticket to a picnic. Yeah, absolutely. And I think your book speaks to the fact that many things have already changed in the world as we know it and, and many more uh, in ways that we can't even anticipate are going to. Uh, Fareed, an absolute pleasure. Please do pick up your copy of Fareed's book, 10 Lessons from a Post-Pandemic World. If you haven't read it, it's a brilliant, educative read. Uh, and remember, you can log on to the Tata Literature Live website uh, for other interesting speakers in this new virtual world that we now live in. Thank you very much, Fareed. Thank you. So nice to see you, Barka. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very stimulating session. We would like to thank our sponsors, title sponsor Tata, co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Projects, and the session was presented by Mojo. Don't forget to watch the Tata Literature Live Awards at 8.30 p.m. See you there.